Welcome to the Healing and Transforming Communities bi-weekly podcast that helps to equip and inform listeners about the issues that impact your community, church, and family by providing responses to the question, what can I do? I'm Marilyn Turner Tripp. I'm Katie Edwards. And I'm Bev Allegretti. And we are your hosts for What Can I Do? Hi, I'm Marilyn Turner Triplett, and thank you for joining our podcast series, What Can I Do? We thank you for joining our first half of our April 3rd interview with Reverend Jermaine Alberti. Okay, um, it is our pleasure to have Reverend Jermaine Alberti with us today. Reverend Alberti serves as the Executive Director of Pathways to Promise. He is a husband, a father, and a former pastor who has a strong heart for mental health. The American Baptist Home Mission Society is also extremely delighted to have Pathways to Promise as one of our community outreach ministries partners. So for those who may be new to Pathways to Promise, uh, Reverend Alberti, can you share a little bit about your organization's mission? Absolutely. So good to be here with you on this morning. Uh, And Pathways to Promise was started in 1988. And I'm so excited that the American Baptist uh, denomination was one of the founding members of Pathways to Promise Mm -hmm. Uh, in 14 other denominations all came together and said, we need to address the stigma uh, around mental illness and we need to educate ourselves around that. And we need to be able to support an organization that can help us do that. And so uh, since 1988, we have been doing just that, providing content to, to denominations to increase mental health literacy, as well as we have been uh, also not only providing content, but also providing support to those congregations. And today we do that same thing through our website, as well as to assessments and uh, trainings. And so I'm just really excited about Pathways collaboration and partnership with uh, faith communities. So that's amazing. I've heard you mention um, mental health and mental health challenges. Can, can we just start with some basics? What do we mean when we talk about mental health? So I think it is so important that when we talk about mental health, that we clearly understand that the term mental health is simply speaking about our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. And so all of us want to maintain a healthy emotional, psychological, and social well-being. But what happens is, is when persons become ill and begin to experience a mental illness, what happens is, is that those emotions, those the psychological well-being, the social well-being may be challenged with certain factors. And those factors are considered what is called risk factors. Okay. And those, those risk factors could be one environment. It could be one's genetic makeup, so one's family history. It could be trauma. All of those things could be things that impact that person and impacting that person cause that person to become ill. Um, and so when we talk about illness, typically clinicians will look at how long has a person been experiencing certain symptoms. Uh, so the duration is important to determine whether that is an illness. The second criteria oftentimes is how severe are these symptoms uh, and what kind of impairment are they having on that person's ability to function. And so what happens many times is, is that persons may not have a mental illness, but they may be having a challenge to their mental health, their ability to function, uh, but yet that has not become so challenging that they cannot function And so they may just be be experiencing a mental health challenge. So the term mental health challenge is inclusive of both those who may be experiencing both an illness or a challenge to their mental uh, health. And so I think that's so important because one in five Americans uh, have a diagnosable mental illness in any given year. Wow. Uh, And so that means that 
one in five people in a room of 20, if you had 25 people, that could mean that five of those 25 people uh, could be impacted with some kind of mental illness or some kind of mental health challenge. And so it, it, it's more common than people would uh, want to admit that it may be. And that admittance uh, of the commonality of mental illness is often wrestled with in our churches. So you're actually raising something that I've been wrestling with, with the, and I was amazed to hear the frequency with with with, with mental health challenges can arise. And so, given that, why why do you think there's so many stigmas associated with mental health issues? Well, I like to talk about stigma, and you know, um, when we talk about uh, stigma, I often think about the ideal of a stigmatism. And a stigmatism actually impairs one ability to see. Uh, mm-hmm. A stigmatism can blur one's vision. And so what's happened is, is I believe that the stigma often is rooted in our own biases that blurs our how we see people. Um, not only in our own biases, but also our own prejudice. Um, and so because of our own bias or because of our own prejudice, it blurs how we see people, which that stigmatism then results in a stigma toward a certain thing. Uh, and so I think that sometimes scripture is used even to blur how we see people who may have a mental illness. So, you know, we're going to talk about this. But think about if you've been told that your joy is in the Lord and the Lord is your strength. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're experiencing depression. Yeah. The question will ask, where's your joy at? I thought your joy was in God. What happened to, to your joy? You know, so then people are made to feel guilty because they're mm-hmm. not walking around feeling joyful every day, but because mm-hmm. they feel depressed. And so oftentimes what happens is the very sacred text that we use to build us up can often be used to tor- tear us down. And I think that stigma, once again, is rooted in cultural bias uh, because we have been taught sometimes in our culture that you are to be strong, that you shouldn't cry, that you, that you uh, are to uh, walk around uh, and, and not let people see your weakness. And so all these different things that have been taught to us uh, from our culture, from our faith tradition, is what, it's how we actually see the world. Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, people do not want to be seen as weak or seen as crazy or seen as, you know, not having it all together. So therefore, people tend to fake it. And in faking it, they actually cause more harm to themselves. Because if you had a broken arm, um, hopefully you would go to your doctor and, right. and have them do an x-ray to make sure that it wasn't broken and get you a proper sling so it can heal properly. But because mental health challenges can be invisible many times, Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see those things. And so persons stand when they're experiencing these things because you don't see it physically. um, Then people tend to go, Oh, they're, they're okay. They're not ill. They're okay. And that's the dilemma. So, um, what the scripture have anything to say to us regarding mental health? I believe it does. I believe it does. Um, I, I believe that, you know, we are called to love our neighbors. Yes. And, you know, I think what happens so many times is, is that, you know, that, Jesus is challenged with who is my neighbor? Mm. <laughs> you know, who is my neighbor? And so he tells a story about a person on the side of the road who has been beaten up and who has been left for dead. And he tells a story about persons who walk by this neighbor for whatever reason they may have had, be it sacred, be it uh, laws of touching people who may be dead or uncleanness or for whatever reason they walk past this person and the least likely person 
she stopped by and helped the person, actually stopped, yes. helped the person, took him to an inn to be cared for, and then said, and wherever else is needed, just let me know. I'll take care of that too. Right. And Jesus was given an illustration that the neighbor was simply the person who loved the person despite his ethnicity, despite whatever bias or prejudice there may have been. It didn't matter. He stopped and he helped. And we know that story in our tradition as the Good Samaritan story. Yes. And that's what we know it as. But I've even challenged folks to get rid of the word good because the reality is, is that to imply that somehow he was good would imply that it was some bad Samaritans. Mm. <laughs> and there's a whole law based upon the concept of the good Samaritan, that if you stop and if you provide aid and you provide assistance, then you acted as the good Samaritan, one who would stop and provide aid to another person. So I, I think that Jesus shows that our love should extend past our own biases, past our own cultural uh, way that we see things. And if somebody is isolated, suffering, need our help, um, even if they're not suffering in a way that we could see, but they are in some kind of distress and, and they need our help, we are called to stop what we are doing and we are called to assist that person to the best of our ability. And where we cannot assist, then we should find someone maybe who could assist. So I, I think that our response as believers is rooted in our love one for the other. Right. Um, that's, that's our response, should be rooted in the love that we have. Uh, but there are numerous scriptures that speak to how communities have responded to people who were different than they were. And one of that is the, the scripture of the uh, man who we know uh, uh, as the demoniac, it's what some, how some uh, scriptures uh, kind of coin this person as demoniac, uh, which to me is really uh, even weird because uh, we talk about in mental health something called person first language. And person first language is when you don't call a person by their illness, but by their name. Mm. And so, you know, you don't go around saying, hey, what's up, cancer? You know, what's right. up, diabetic? You know, what's up? You know, we, we don't go around calling folks by their physical illnesses, but people with mental illness will say, oh, oh you know, she's bipolar. Okay. Or, oh, well, you know, he's schizophrenic. With t taking away the person's whole identity and personhood and just calling them by their illness, not by their name. Yeah. And so even the term of the scripture or how the subtitles have called this person the demoniac, Jesus, I believe in that story, uh, and we know it well, when he meets the person, doesn't even address supposedly what his issue is that got him in the cemetery in the first place. Mm -hmm. That he was cutting, that he was running amok in the town, so they chained him up. He doesn't even address any of that. The first question Jesus asked the man What's your name? is, what is your name? Yeah, yeah. What is your name? And the text says that, uh, some spirits began to speak and Jesus is, I, I believe is just like, I'm not talking to you. Listen, get out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to him. And in speaking to the man, there's a beautiful part of rest restoration that says, and the town people came and the man was clothed. Yes. And was in his right mind. Mm -hmm. uh, he had had an encounter. He had, had an experience with Jesus that changed his life. And I believe that uh, we have to be able to be clear that mental illness does not equate to demonic possession. Mm -hmm. uh, and that becomes a dilemma in many of our you know, churches is that people believe if you just pray it out, fast out, just do these different spiritual disciplines, that's going to get it all together. But I'm sorry, if I can't see, give me glasses. If I can't hear, give me a hearing aid. Mm. If my heart is not working, give me a pacemaker. What am I saying? If there is some deficiency in my physical well-being and there's a tool that can assist me to be better or feel better, please give me that tool and still pray for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> still pray for me. Right, so right. The same thing is true with persons who are experiencing mental illness. Okay, if it is demonic possession, try the spirit, by the spirit, see whether it be of God. And if it is that, then pray, pray about it. 
But if it is not, discern and say, how can we give assistance to you, my friend, to you, my brother, my sister? How can we, how can we help you? And so I think that as churches, we must be holistic in our approaches where we not only are praying for folks and not only are we um, trying to support them, but that we holistically say, hey, I'll go with you to adoption department. You know, I'll take you if you need me to or, or you know, listen, uh, when you're depressed, give me a call. Or when you are uh, experiencing some thoughts that you know are not your thoughts and you feel suicidal, you're not alone. I'm here for you. Give me a call or, or call a hotline. Um, right. it's, it's about an equipping of the church of how to respond. Uh, and I think that's what's so important. And I think this conversation that you are everybody else to have is so important because I think we don't act because we don't know how to act. So, so I hear you talking about integrating our faith in Christ and all that that can be done in terms of healing with some practical uh, um, traditional medical resources to, to address mental challenges and mental health issues. Is, is that, am I hearing you correctly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of what I was uh, even talking about earlier when I talked about the Samaritan story, uh, Pat was the promise we offer a program called companionship and Companionship is rooted in five practices, and those are how we hospitable one to the other. So how do we create a welcoming space for those that we encounter? Um, you know, another practice is that of how do we come side by side? Uh, how do we come alongside that person and walk with them together? Uh, Amos said, how can two walk together except they be agreed? How do we come in agreement and alignment to walk side by side with a person uh, another practice is that of how do we neighbor a person? So how do we become yeah. neighbor yeah. and yeah. see each other as equal, mm-hmm. as equal? Despite your illness, despite what you're dealing with, we are still equals. Um, and the other two practices are very important. Uh, and that uh, fourth one is listening. How do we listen to one another? And we talk about this ideal of a soul story. How do we listen to the soul story? That very thing that has rooted that person in who they are as a person. We all have a soul story, something that has shaped the core of who we are as a person. Um, and then the last thing is how do we accompany a person? How do, how do we create that circle of care for that person? And so these five practices of companionship, uh, which is rooted actually in a homeless uh, ministry work of a guy named Craig Rennebaum, a good friend of mine in Seattle, Washington, uh, and he said to us as an organization, listen, we tr- I trust you to take this work and carry, carry it on. And we've done that. We've tr- trained, we'll traveled around the country and trained folks to be instructors of the program. Um, because I think that being a companion one to the other is really what we're called to do. We're called to walk alongside each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and not only those within our faith community, but those outside. Sure. Uh, that's why the that's why the story of uh, Emmaus, the, the role of Emmaus, is so so powerful because they walked alongside Jesus and didn't even realize it until he was gone. Mm. And they said, "Did not our hearts burn with mm. mm. You know, they just walked alongside this man having a conversation and didn't even realize who it was until he and oh, that was Jesus. Wow! And isn't that how we should be? We just walk alongside people. And just know that they should just know that they just had an encounter with somebody who was connected to God. So you're raising so many interesting points. Um, you're talking about things that we can do. Are there are there resources or places that people can go to to better understand how to do what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I'm, I'm going to do that shameless plug and say they should go to first our website, right? They should go, <laughs> they should go to pathways, uh, number two promise.org uh, pathways to promise.org. And on that site, they will find a sister, a group of ours, uh, mental health ministry, which is now a program of pathways to promise. Uh, and uh, when they go to that website, they will see, um, you know, link to mental health ministries where there are tons of 
articles and books and other uh, resources and guides that they can download. So just by going to pathwaysofpromise.org is a very good starting point for many people to find what kind of resources that, that they can uh, find to do ministry. There's even a link on our website to book an appointment with me and uh, to do a uh, basically initial consultant to determine is creating a mental health ministry or wellness ministry something that your congregation is equipped to do. And mm -hmm. so we uh, follow basically four phases when we talk to a group and we talk about how do you assess the need for mental health ministry, for addiction ministry? How do you assess the need for that? Uh, and then once you assess that there's a need, the next step is then how do you become educated to now address the needs that you have discovered through your assessment? And then that third phase is that of implementation. How do you implement now what you have learned? So is that a mental health ministry? Is that a regular support group? Is that that the pastor now embeds in his sermons uh, messages around increasing mental health literacy and decreasing stigma? Is it that when we have an altar call, instead of only praying for things we can see, that we pray for things we cannot see? Is it that we change our language and instead of saying stuff like, I could have lost my mind, but God realized somebody in the audience might have had a psychotic break and they still love God? Yes. Do we change our language for things like, you know, but for the grace of God, you know, I could have ABC. And then how do people in the audience who have suffered with depression and anxiety and other illnesses, how do they feel about God's grace toward them? It's just being more cognizant and aware of, of how we talk about certain things uh, because people who are experiencing certain illnesses may feel as if God has forsaken them. Yes. Because why did God favor this person over me? Once again, it's that education that, then results in implementation of how we do ministry. And then, of course, the last phase, once you implement a plan and sustainability, how you sustain what you have begun. So when people meet with me, I walk them through those four phases. You know, how can we first assess? And then what kind of education might you need, like mental health first aid or companionship or some other NAMI connected programs? Um, and then from that point, how do we implement this work? May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, July is National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, uh, October is NAMI Mental Illness, Illness Awareness Week. There are certain things that are happening every month. And so April is Child Abuse Awareness Month. How do we take these different things and raise them up in our congregation and say, let's increase awareness around this so that when we become more aware, we can hopefully do more better at how we approach people experiencing these things. Um, and so that that's what we can do, Pathways. We can help you assess, educate, implement, and sustain the work that you discover you need. It truly is a calling. So my shameless plug, you know, the name of this podcast series is yes. What Can I Do? Yes. So I'm hearing you provide some answers to that question in terms of not just the church, but the persons within the church becoming involved 